All right, as we continue on in 1 John, uh, we're just going to look at these two verses this morning. Uh, it's going to be hopefully quite simple to grasp what's in my head as I try to communicate it to you. There, that sounds like a simple thing to do, right? <laughs> Get inside Grady's head. But there's, and there's really, I don't have a PowerPoint. There's really just one thing that I want us to remember this morning. One theme of these two verses. That, and it's that if you are in Christ, then your love is a righteous love. And you're going to hear that more and more this morning, uh, over and over again. And hopefully, uh, that will make sense as we get to the end and as we, as we go along. If you are in Christ, then your love is a righteous love. So these two verses, our text this morning, it, it gives us a command and then it gives us a caution. And the, this caution, um, that, or the command is simply to love one another. And the caution is given as a, a negative example from the story of Cain and Abel. So we're going to explore this comparison between, between love and wickedness, the, 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 the righteous against the unrighteous, which is keeping in keeping with what John has been writing to us uh, in his letter. Um, that is John's inspired words, John's inspired teaching, has been teaching us the difference between um, living in the light as the children of God compared to living in darkness as the world does. John uses contrast throughout his letter to show this, this, this vast difference between God's children and the world. As, as a reminder of this, of this contrast that has been covered in this short letter of John, look back with me to chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. John wrote, and this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. There, there is the distinction of, of walking in the light of God against walking in the darkness of the world. And this, this dichotomy is also shown just a few verses later, uh, and also in chapter 1, and verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar in his word is not in us. And if you remember Pastor Kyle teaching uh, on this, that, that the Christian agrees with God, that he is indeed in a fact a sinner and, and consequently is in need of forgiveness of that sin and reconciliation with God through Christ Jesus. And, and there's more of this contrast. Keep up with me. Uh, there's keeping the commandments of God contrary to not keeping his commandments found in, in uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are, are in him. There's loving your brother versus hating your brother in, oh, in verses 10 through 11, also in chapter 2. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness blinded his eyes. There's loving God against loving the world or the things of the world uh, found in verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's having the, the truth of God in us contrasted against having lies in, in verse 21. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. 
and, and also doing good and upright things of God as opposed to uh, sinning as shown in First uh, John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The one who does righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does sin is of the devil, because the devil sins from the beginning. The children of God are righteous. The, the children of the devil do not practice righteousness or love their brother. And the, the two verses of our text this morning kind of serve as an explanation of the statement just before our verses that are that that are found that is found in verse 10 it's a these two verses serve as kind of a springboard into where john's going next it it looks back at what he's covered and it and it looks forward to to where he's going it's kind of they're transit tra transitory verses i'll stick with that word but first john three ten. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. Everyone who does not do righteousness is not of God, as well as the one who does not love his brother. And the simple message in verse 11, that we should love one another. So in verse 11, we read that this is a message, uh, is one that uh, which you have heard from the beginning. John had written of this earlier in his letter in, in, in chapter 2, verse 7. He wrote, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. So this message, this, this old commandment from the beginning, as faithfully taught by the apostles of Christ, and and we will see this more as we move on in John's letter, verse 23. Uh, he writes, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he gave a commandment to us. Now, Jesus gave this command to the apostles at the, at the last Passover meal. Uh, turn to John's gospel in chapter 13. And we'll see uh, just where it's recorded that Jesus gave this command to his apostles. John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And Jesus stated even further on in, in, in chapter 15, he said, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end, hearkening back to uh, the beginning of uh, in John. And, and also in chapter 15, he says, this I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So here then is the commandment to love your brothers and sisters in Christ, given by Jesus, faithfully taught by the apostles, the message um, which you have heard from the beginning. And so re we see that repeatedly over and over again. John instructs his readers those who are in Christ, united to him, to love each other. Uh, just quickly, don't try to flip with me. Uh, back in 1 John chapter 4, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And, and, and <laughs> we did it backwards. We went third, third letter of John, second letter of John, first letter of John. But if we look back to the second to second John verses five and six, he says, now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. 
This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. This old commandment of God, fulfilled in Christ and, and will be displayed in the lives of his people, his, his church. It goes, it goes back in, into redemptive history uh, to the law told of in Leviticus 19. Uh, it says, you shall, not take it, you shall not take vengeance and you shall not keep your anger against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. And this command is, is inherent in, in Jesus' reply to the Pharisee in Matthew 22. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and, and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law, the whole law and prophets. And even further, the Apostle Paul echoed uh, this command in Galatians 5, 13 and 14. He writes, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in Romans chapter 13, Paul continues. He writes, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not work evil against the neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You want more? James. James writes in his letter, in chapter 2, he says, If however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So there should be now no notion whatsoever, no doubt in anyone's mind that we who are in Christ must love one another. It's absolutely crystal clear that loving one another is, is evidence that we have been united to Christ who first loved us. It is proof that, it is proof that we are, are living in Christ, that, that our nature has been changed from self to selflessness. Christians should be characterized by love because Christ commanded it, and, in, and he showed it by his example how to love, exemplified by a life of, of holiness and service and glorifying God, lovingly, humbly, serving like Christ. Mark wrote in, in chapter 10, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Keeping the commandments as Christ did. Uh, keeping his commandments as John writes of this in chapter 5, which, what did you say, eight, nine months from now we'll be there? Chapter 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. It is essential to know that, that, that love marks the Christian life because, because love is an attribute of God. It, it emanates from God. Without God giving to us love, we would not know what love is. We would not be able to know what love is. It's, that's displayed perfectly in those outside of Christ. They have no idea of what love is. It's like knowledge. We couldn't have knowledge apart from God giving to us knowledge. You cannot have love apart from God. One more clarification about your love as a, as a Christian. And I'll repeat, if you are in Christ, then your love is a righteous love. 
Because if we, if we define love, if we look at it as compared and contrasting it between Cain and Abel, in, in verse 12, Cain is described as evil because his deeds were evil. Um, that is, his, his, his nature was evil, and this was evidenced by his life, uh, his deeds, what he did. And with Abel, how were his deeds characterized? As righteous. So if Cain is given as an example of what a Christian is not to be, unloving and, and evil, then we are to be righteous and to love one another, keeping the commandments of God and being obedient in that. Being righteous, like righteous Abel. Righteous, if we look at what that word means, it's just a... Uh, a good and proper uh, conduct. It's good and, and proper according to the standard of God. It's it's uh, being obedient to Him. So, if you are in Christ, then your love is a love that is right according to God's standard. If you're in Christ, then your love is a righteous love. And we can only have this righteous love because we are made righteous in Christ. Um, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him according to God's grace and mercy is shown in us shown to us so compare this righteous love with the type of love that the, that the world wants to define to, to those in the world Loving one another typically means an acceptance of the sin that they, they're immersed in. It's, it's giving approval of their sinful lifestyle, whatever it may be. To them, mentioning um, that they are characterized by, by, by sin and what they are doing uh, marks that they are sinful is hating them. And in some extreme cases, um, your words against them are considered as doing violence against them. They love the darkness rather than the light. They love their sin rather than loving Christ. Their deeds are evil. The world absolutely rejects a love that is righteous. <coughs> A love that is in accordance with God's standard. It's a warped definition of what love is. It's not true love. Remember, love comes from God. And God cannot approve of sin. So how could love? Scripture states exactly the opposite uh, of, of what the world um, considers love to be. And the Bible states emphatically and repeatedly that God hates sin. But God first loved us, even in our sin, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's mercy and grace and his love is proven in that he loved his people and sent Christ into the world so that the world might be saved through him. Remember those words that we have studied up till now? We can be saved through Christ and be called children of God, loving one another with a righteous love. As our text states, and, and we covered it a bit, this distinctive nature of the Christian life of, of loving one another is contrasted against the love or the actions of the wicked Cain. So back to our text in verse 12. Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And many of you know the story of, of Cain and Abel, yet I want to be instructive to those 
who may not be familiar with these two brothers. Keep your place here in 1 John. But please turn almost all the way to the front to Genesis chapter 4 to see uh, this description of Cain and Abel, starting in verse 1. And this account takes place after Adam and Eve were sent out from the Garden of Eden. Of Eden. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a cultivator of the ground. So it happened in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to Yahweh of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And Yahweh had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is lying at the door and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Then Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And it happened when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then Yahweh said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now cursed are you from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to Yahweh, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And it will be that whoever finds me will kill me. So Yahweh said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh appointed a sign for Cain that so no one who found him would strike him. Then Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and settled into the land of Nod, east of Eden. So this is what 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 is referring to Cain killing his brother Abel. And our text then asks the question, and for what reason did he slay him? Why did Cain kill his brother? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain was of the evil one and his deeds were evil. <clears throat> Abel, as, as we read in, in Hebrews 11, uh, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than, than Cain through which he was approved as being righteous, God approving his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So Cain's deed uh, informs us of his true nature, a nature that is enslaved to sin, it's self-exalting, and it is outside of the obedience to God. Cain didn't love his brother. And I would, I would say that most likely Cain didn't love anyone except himself. He didn't submit to that old commandment of love that we learned about earlier. A commandment that extends all the way back to before Cain. It reaches even further back in Genesis and it's found in a promise, the first promise recorded in Scripture. And Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than any of the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity 
between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. God promised Satan that there would be war between he and Eve, between the seed of Satan and the seed of Eve. Uh, though Eve can have physical children, we've already seen that she did with Cain and then Abel, this cannot mean that Satan can have physical children. So this must be a spiritual promise. It's a war between Satan's spiritual seed and Eve's spiritual seed, which is which is played out in history in the lives of, of mankind. It's recorded for us in redemptive history written in scripture. It's it's witnessed by us presently in modernity and will continue until Christ returns on the day of the Lord. When he will descend from heaven with a shout, with a with a voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and he and we will meet him in the air as he gathers his church, judges the wicked and brings the culmination of redemptive history and the ushering in of glory in the age to come. So this war, both 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 physical and spiritual, begins with Eve's first children, Cain and Abel. They are the, the physical offspring of Eve. And they are both uh, the spiritual offspring of Eve. Cain uh, is the spiritual seed of of, of Satan who was the, the evil one and, and Abel that was the spiritual seed of Eve of Eve a, a child of God a brother of all God's children <coughs> Eve's spiritual offspring are the elect people of God throughout all time his his children saved through and and united with the promised seed Christ Jesus and we see this continuation of Eve's uh, spiritual offspring in the birth of Seth. Then Adam knew his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has set for me another seed in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of Yahweh. And we know that this war continues with Satan's spiritual offspring as well. We learned of it recently in 1 John 3, 8. The one who does sin is of the devil because the devil sins from the beginning. The Son of God was manifested for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And Jesus said to those seeking to kill him, He's, Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of the father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Cain warred against righteousness. He showed contempt and hatred for Abel. He, he, was, he was jealous of God's approval of, of, of Abel. He was angry with his brother and he gave himself over in his sin leading to murder. And how like the world this is. <clears throat> when, when the world encounters holiness and righteousness in Christians, they show scorn against it. They Hatred and rage and venom spews from their mouth in their speech that's directed at us. All levels of this world uh, wars against Christ and so wars against his church. Individuals uh, hate us and they act against us. Governments hate us and pass laws restricting us. The entire world is opposed to us because we have a righteous love through Christ. And it's not just, it's not just outside of the local assemblies. For the offspring of Satan also sits among the congregation. 
examples of Cain are, are, are outside of the church, but, but, but representatives of Cain are also found within the church gathering. This is a war that is, is, is fought within and, and without. We're attacked from all sides. Yet in this, Jesus says that we are blessed. Blessed are you when men hate you and exclude you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. We've learned that, that we should love one another. <laughs> that this love is, is, a, is a righteous love. A, a biblically defined love. A righteous love that is only found in Christ Jesus. And we've contrasted this type of love, the, the, the love that God's children have, against the hatred of Cain, who is the uh, spiritual child, part of the spiritual children of Satan. It's, it's love versus hate. Kind of gives a different meaning to that slogan, choose love. I noticed that on some football helmets or something. It's the children of God versus the, the evil world. And their father, the devil, those, those who are, are in Christ, opposite of those who are condemned in the world. To have the love of Christ, this sacrificial, uh, serving, righteous love. You must be emptied of yourself, emptied of your selfish desires and your self-exaltation. Spurgeon said, you will never know the fullness of Christ. Until you know the emptiness of everything but Christ. You see in, in this contrast of the righteous against the wicked that we have covered this morning. I, I don't want you to leave here filled with, with any sense of pride in yourself for being a Christian. Who, who, who works to keep their, their conduct holy. Because that glory belongs to Christ alone. And I don't want you to look at those in the world as the enemy. They're not. Satan is the enemy. Those wicked people are simply slaves to their, their sinful nature. And we've seen this uh, in this war that has been raging for centuries. And lest we forget, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We, prior to being united uh, with Christ, also walked with the wicked, uh, walked within the world, slaves to the lust of our flesh, and were by nature children of wrath, as they are. <laughs> I'll continue with this passage from Ephesians because I can't state it any clearer than this. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. So boast in Christ to this evil world, to to that person who is extremely difficult to love. Boast of Christ to them. The, the greatest act of righteous love that, that we can do for them. Is to proclaim to them the good news that Christ came to save sinners. The gospel message invite them to come to the well of Christ Jesus and drink. The water of life. 
Jesus, who, who, who bore this, the sins of, of many, he bore the curse, he defeated death, plead with them to, to join Christ in, in his death and his resurrection, to repent of their sins, to turn away from their, their quest for spiritual autonomy, and from their wandering in darkness, and, and come to the light of the world, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come to Jesus, our righteous love. The, the gospel. But that gospel is not just for them. It's also for us to be reminded of it daily because we need it. We're reminded when we gather. We're reminded when we uh, come to the table and partake of the bread and the wine. It's a gospel remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Shown. His sacrifice shown through a righteous love. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for, um, for these two verses from this letter of John that, that speaks so much to us. Verses that we, we might just pass over but not fully understand. Father, we pray for uh, you to grant to us knowledge of what you're trying to tell us. That we understand uh, this great love that you have for us, this righteous love that's defined by you, not defined by this world or our emotions, but defined objectively by you. We ask for your help to be that love to this world. And Father, we thank you for the constant reminders, the, the means of grace that you give us that, that, that show us what has been done for us. May that cause in us a greater hunger for you, a greater uh, thirst for knowledge of you, a boldness and a zeal to proclaim this message of mercy and grace through your Son to a darkened world. May it intrude into every thought that we may have and guide it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.